my name is Dario Hasenstab. I have two degrees in international affairs, and I'm here with Paul Hagritz, a former university professor of mine, as well as an IR consultant. And together, we're bursting the Western bubble. Today, we will analyze cancel culture through the lens of the Western bubble, because while Western societies have many strengths and significant weaknesses, in order to analyze these, we use the concept of the Western bubble. If you would like to know more about this concept, how this podcast started, or who we are, make sure to listen to our introduction episode. Hi, Balder. Why are we speaking about this topic today? Why are we speaking about cancel culture? Hello, Dario. Um, Happy New Year. Good to see you again. Uh, We are talking about cancel culture today because it's felt like a good way to start 2024 with the message of let's be nice to each other. Let's be generous towards each other. Uh, Cancel culture has gotten into an position where people no longer give each other the benefit of the doubt and it just becomes about a violent imposition of certain moral values rather than an evolution of society to make things better. So the overall message hopefully for today's episodes to people is uh, give each other the benefit of the doubt, be nice. Having said that, I've always been a little bit reluctant to talk about cancel culture because very often those who criticize cancel culture, wokeness, political correctness, do so with a very specific political agenda. Um, To stereotype a little bit, it's often people on the extreme right or relative political right, men who feel uncomfortable with the loss of patriarchy or who do not understand why we can't go back to an imaginary 1950s. Um, And they feel uncomfortable with the changing world order. They feel uncomfortable with the fact that traditional institutions have lost power uh, compared to, let's say, 50 years ago, and therefore then they rant about wokeness, they rant about political correctness, they rant about cancel culture. That's not our aim here. Our aim is not political in that sense. It is just to highlight how intellectual conversation and societal evolution require a kindness. Having said that... uh, I have always felt a little bit comfortable talking about cancel culture or wokeness or political correctness because it is often done by people and stereotypically right wing men, if you like, who have a political agenda to rant about those concepts, right? They they feel uncomfortable with the changing world order. They feel uncomfortable with the fact that their patriarchal power structures are no longer there and they use cancel culture or political correctness as a red herring, if you like, as a way to basically uh, claim that uh, their free speech is being um, being attacked and that, that, that there is some kind of objective reason against it, whereas in reality, they just want to make the political point that um, these new social dynamics are not desirable. We don't want to do that here. We don't have political motivations like that. Our motivation today is to highlight the fact that cancel culture can be detrimental for honest, open, generous, kind, intellectual conversations. And what are the facts? Cancel culture is a social phenomenon where individuals or entities face public condemnation and boycotts, often on social media, due to perceived offensive actions or statements. It involves withdrawing support to hold individuals accountable, but critics argue it can lack nuance and stifle free speech. Around 2015, the concept of cancelling had become widespread on black Twitter to refer to a personal decision, sometimes seriously, sometimes in jest, to stop supporting a person or organization. After numerous cases of online shaming gained wide notoriety, The term cancellation was increasingly used to describe a widespread outrage online response to a single proactive statement against a single target. What is the bubble? So when we're talking about this and kind of echoing what you just said in the introduction, um, this phenomenon of cancel culture is born out of social movements. We are not against social movements, right? We're not, I mean, depending on the social movement, I might support, I might not support it. Um, but uh, like on the grand scale, right, we are, we're not talking about the ideology or the content behind cancel culture, but we are treating cancel culture here very much as a tactic, 
right? Um, and I, I, I kind of made a comparison about this in the lead up to this episode. And uh, listeners, please, please let us know whether this comparison works. Um, you might remember our episode about terrorism, um, where we very much differentiate between terrorist tactics and someone or whatever could be terrorism, right? Because that's not defined and someone can't really be a terrorist. You can't be someone who uses terrorist tactics. And here, uh, right, it's the same for me, at least, with regards to cancel culture, right? So you have a person um, who is engaging in the tactic of canceling someone, right? Of boycotting them or on a grander scale and getting other people to boycott that person as well in order to harm them, in order to exclude them from the conversation, in order to exclude them Uh, from the public, um, which then led to a very interesting conversation we had where in terrorism or when using terrorist tactics, you're being, you're right, you're a normal person. You, you go about your business and at some point something in your life happens and you feel so strongly about an issue that a switch is being switched where you suddenly no longer feel empathy towards other human beings, but you feel like you need to kill them. And then, then you said... That sounds interesting because there must something must happen within the lives of people who suddenly engage in the tactic of canceling others that they believe, okay, whatever they have said is so terrible that I need to now engage in the tactic of excluding them from society in that sense. Yes, exactly. So there is a very substantial difference between someone who just says, hey, I have a problem with the way you phrase things. I have a problem with the way you do things. I am going to try to change your perspective to I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to make you lose your job. I am going to get you out um, away from YouTube. Now, I, why the terrorism parallel um, analogy works well, I think, is that terrorism has been used by many different ideological perspectives. There have been Christian terrorists, uh, atheist terrorists, left-wing terrorists, right-wing terrorists, etc., etc. Uh, and the same with social movements. Social movements are a fundamental aspect of society, and it's the only way that society can grow, regardless of whether you agree with every movement or not. We love social movements, civil rights movements, women's um, emancipation, um, anti-nuclear movements from the 1970s and 1980s. Those kinds of movements are very positive uh, movements to make society better. But the moment you then, just like with terrorism, believe that now your moral righteousness allows you to actually hurt other people who have a different perspective, hurt um, their family, hurt their livelihoods, that is the moment that something goes wrong inside of your Had something goes wrong inside of your psychology and you no longer see the other individual as a complex being that deserves kindness and generosity and respect. And that's when society goes awry. Right. It's, it's, it's the same, for example, for the climate movement. So I'm sure that the majority of our listeners and the majority of the people out there will say that Yeah, we need to do something about global warming. It doesn't seem to be going too well for the planet Earth right now. That doesn't mean that you endorse the last generation or the Just Stop Oil or Extinction Rebellion movement who are very radical in their tactics of trying to convince others. Right? And so for me, and also for the sake of this episode, that's how we're going to treat um, the, the idea of cancer culture as well. Right? Just as a tactic, we're not... Uh, We, well, we, I mean, who are we to basically judge whether the movement that is using this tactic um, is a good or a bad one, right? I mean, it's, as you said, it comes from the left, it comes from the right, it comes from all sides uh, of, of society. And we're really just concerned about the tactic itself because it can be incredibly damaging. Absolutely. The one thing, though, that maybe needs to be clarified here is that if uh, Stop Oil just does something silly um, like uh, throwing um, oil or something at a painting, which I don't think is particularly nice, that is still a long way away from destroying an individual's life, right? And uh, the fact that some movements need radical approaches uh, to basically be heard is not something new. The, the civil rights movement was radical in um, their marches, in the red, and that was a way for them 
to actually be seen and the media to cover them. Every social movement needs a certain bit of radicalism, but radicalism does not mean destroying another human being's livelihood or right to speak or anything like that. Which, to be honest, I didn't think that this actually existed until a few, I would say maybe two years ago, right? This phenomenon of cancel culture. I thought, that, you know, it's a your typical American cultural phenomenon that's receiving a lot of attention because it's the United States. I personally didn't take this very seriously. And I honestly, right, because I mean, the most popular example of cancel culture is J.K. Rowling, right? The author of, of the Harry Potter books. And to me, she always seemed to be doing fine, despite people being angry about her. Uh, angry with her on the internet. She seemed to be still selling her books and her movies and so on. Um, but, if, uh, and this to me happened two years ago during my master's degree, uh, right, um, where I witnessed basically the attempt of cancel culture in person. Uh, it was in an economics class. Um, and at my university, it was the case that the last lecture, the professor could always freely choose what to do, right? There was no curriculum for that. And our economics professor um, decided to talk about inequality, um, and he did so by going over various scientific studies that uh, studied inequality, um, right, le left and right in different areas of society. And one of them uh, basically talked about um, how how the police stops uh, different ethnicities in the United States. And during the day, uh, there was actually very little difference. Um, no, no, there, there was a sorry, the other way around. During the day, there was a lot of difference between how many times different ethnicities were stopped. Um, there was a, there was a disproportionate amount of black and Latinos being stopped, but during the night, right when you couldn't really look into the car, um, that dropped, that changed, right. And so we were, we're talking about that, um, and then there were still some control variables uh, that need to be accounted for, such as that because uh, right the blacks and Latinos uh, are from economically uh, weaker groups, they sometimes had like there was a higher likelihood of them having a broken taillight. And suddenly the class got really angry, or certain elements in class got really angry at the professor, basically saying, oh, you're reproducing stereotypes here. Um, and he's like, no, I'm not. I'm just reading the study. Um, and, and students got really angry at him uh, and then went to the university leadership uh, to demand that this, that this man uh, was no longer allowed to teach a course because he, he dared to reproduce stereotypes. Right? And that was the first time that I had experienced the attempt of cancel culture um, and uh, I mean, all I can say is that a professor uh, didn't come back to university. I don't know whether that was the reason or whether there were any other reasons, but that was the first time I experienced this. And I think you, as a professor yourself, I don't think there has been an organized campaign against you, but you felt this new cultural phenomenon as well. Sure, absolutely. And I would like to point out, you mentioned J.K. Rowling before, but she's okay because she's a billionaire and she's got good lawyers and she's also very creative. So she can... Uh, she can stand her ground, but a single professor at a university doesn't have that power. So uh, that is when it becomes very dark. And <clears throat> in my in my case, I mean, like I said, I mean, I'm generally uh, without wanting to flex. Students seem to be happy with my courses, um, and 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 I'm not at all worried about being cancelled. But uh, even now, recently in course evaluations, students always have to submit course evaluations at the end of a course, which is very good because they can give feedback constructive hopefully uh, about what was good about the course what was maybe less convincing about the course etc etc and and literally a student said something along the lines of the um, this was the worst professor ever uh, the university needs to reconsider uh, having him at university now this was only one student and and got counterbalanced by lots of other students but that to me is so violent um, it's one thing that a student doesn't like what you have to say it's possible that they don't like you as a person you know human humanity is complex it it can be that they feel that you said something they consider offensive all of those things can happen but to go from a professor saying something that you feel uncomfortable with to i'm going to destroy this person's life i'm going to make sure that he can't earn a living anymore because I'm going to tell the university to get rid of him is incredibly, incredibly mean-spirited. Um, and there is, there, there's a very, very big area in between where you can take other type of action. First of all, talk to the professor, say, hey, I felt very uncomfortable with what you said. Um, <clears throat> then 
um, if that doesn't work, write a letter to the university saying, I've got a problem with some political biases in the university, or uh, please make sure that you do not just uh, promote one type of narrative. There are so many things you can do to improve, if you like, the intellectual conversation within an institution rather than trying to destroy someone's life. Now, I'm in the luxurious position that even if I were cancelled from the university, I would still have a job because the university is a side job for me. But still, the the point stands, right? Um, trying to get a professor fired is a sign of a world where people no longer show any kind of kindness or generosity towards the other, towards the other side. And that's cancel culture for you. See, uh, it's interesting that you use the word uh, world um, because I would say that this mainly happens in the Western world. And this is also a relatively new phenomenon, right? I mean, we've seen censorship, state censorship throughout uh, most of humanity, <laughs> basically since the existence of the state. But the fact that this is now happening bottom up, right, that individuals are taking it upon themselves to correct or censor or cancel uh, others out there with 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 a large group uh, behind them and and obviously with the help of technology, that is a rather new phenomenon. And this I would say exclusively happens in the West or is an exclusively Western phenomenon. And here the the question that's that's to be raised now is okay, what does the West do differently than the rest of the world? And why is the West doing this? And hello, welcome, dear listeners. This is why we're talking about the Western bubble. Um, so, Balder, what's right? Let, let's let's do John Stuart Mill. Let's do a, a most a most uh, different case study, basically, or more similar case study in this case. Um, what's the West doing differently to the rest of the world that maybe in a phenomenon like this may have emerged? Well, we can at least look at certain clear um, dynamics, right? Uh, one is liberalism, not liberalism in the nineteenth century sense of hey, we need to get rid of the old structures and all that, and we need to pay more attention to individual human well-being. But liberalism gone awry, liberalism in overdrive, right? Where in some ways, if you go too far with liberalism, like, generally, as my father always said, everything in moderation, right? Liberalism in moderation is great. Capitalism in moderation is great. But if you go too far with liberalism or capitalism, what you do is you start worshipping the individual, not just any individual, yourself. And you're no longer part of a community. You don't see yourself as one of 8 billion complex human individuals that are all trying to get along, that are all trying to get by, but you see yourself as the... Um, core component of um of of judgment of of well-being and you are competing with others in a extreme radical liberal capitalist society you uh, go into overdrive um, to, sort of to paraphrase nietzsche here elevating yourself as an individual to god status and that is incredibly western because that leads to a complete lack of social cohesion at that moment you're basically alone against the rest. And at that moment, you become incredibly sensitive to anything that you feel doesn't fit within your own narrative. Someone says something that sounds shocking to you. Oh, that person is a threat. Uh, rather than saying, hey, I live in a community. Let's talk about this and let's see if we can find some common ground here. No, 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 no. I need to get rid of that person because that person sounds scary to me, could be a danger to me. Uh that is certainly a part of it. Then if you then take it one step further, once you're in that place that you have elevated yourself to as the arbiter of everything that is right and wrong, no modesty, no humility about maybe that you could be wrong, that your moral compass could be awry. Um, at that moment, life is pretty scary because you're alone, right? So you're fighting against the rest. And what you do then, you try to find other people that have a similar... Um, that have a similar outlook to you and you form a tribe and as a tribe you start fighting the other tribe so you become very aggressive in your political outlook towards the other tribe i am an extreme individual i can't do this by myself i'm going to identify those who think this exactly the same like me and together tribally we are going to fight those who think differently from us and at that moment by othering the other tribe by putting the others outside of your own circle 
you dehumanize them and then asking or demanding that they lose their job or demanding that they lose their YouTube channel or anything like that becomes a normal step because clearly they're the enemy. This is almost a topic for a different episode. Um, the, the lack of of social networks, right? And the original social networks, not the technology social networks where you, I mean, now particularly in the West because of this liberalism gone mad, liberalism and overdrive, we have left our original social networks, which used to be the family or the little town you're in. We are now usually far removed from them, right? I mean, I'm no longer living with my parents. I live in a different city. Um, I also move cities once in a while, right? So every time you're kind of ripped out of your social network, of your net for stability. And I assume that this leads to a lot of, right, anxiety, a lot of, like, there's no longer that stability. And we're living in a world like that, right, in the West, where we can no longer rely on our social networks. And that fear and that anxiety, right, that we are, we're seeing and we're feeling, particularly within my generation, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's now that we just talk about it more, but I feel like that around me, everyone has some form of anxiety, some form of trigger anxiety, and so on. And I think that this then combined with, okay, others are, others are disrespecting me, others are making me feel uncomfortable, I am being disrespected, then obviously you start lashing out because you want to protect yourself uh, in that way, you turn to what, uh, towards that extreme tribalism that you have described, and the ultimate form of this is then cancel culture, right? So this would be my best guess of where this cultural phenomenon in the West has come from. And I've, I've said this in the past, I am so grateful to have been, to, to grow up, to become an adult in the 1990s. Not that in the 1990s everything was better, um, you know, the, 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 when it comes to sexism and racism and, um, you know, general patriarchal structures, 2024 is definitely better than the 1990s. But psychologically, it was just so much easier than it is for the new generation because of what we've been talking about. The current generation, younger generation, is suffering mentally uh, way more than previous gen generations. Part of it is technology, social media, etc. Part of it is what we've just discussed, uh, liberalism in overdrive. And, and it's, it's painful to see, but it also leads to a serious, serious threat to intellectualism. To, to give you another example um, from a evaluation, uh, it now sounds as if all my students hate me, but it's still um, it's still informative, I think, to mention this. A student who wrote uh, that I had said something that made them feel very uncomfortable, and as a result, couldn't participate in the class anymore, and. Uh, basically, therefore, uh, hated the course. Now, what is serious about that is, of course, if I make a student feel uncomfortable, that is my failure as an educator. Uh, obviously, it's never ever my, my purpose nor my intention to make students feel uncomfortable. Um, we discuss complex things related to war, genocide, human suffering in class. And it could be that in the three-hour lecture, sometimes a few sentences come out that are badly phrased. In a productive intellectual environment, what you want to do is then be able to say to the professor, hey, I believe that you said something that is either wrong or I feel very uncomfortable with what you said. And if you don't want to do that publicly, you go to the professor afterwards uh, in private and say, or you send him an email saying, hey, I didn't like what you said. I, it, it wasn't right. But instead, this student writes, I couldn't participate anymore without ever having talked to me about it, right? No student came up to me in class saying I felt uncomfortable with it. So the result is that now a student is no longer engaged with the class, is no longer intellectually fulfilling their purpose at the university because their emotional state of mind can't cope with someone saying something that feels uncomfortable to them. That is incredibly dangerous for society because let's say that I said something horribly sexist or racist or whatever the complaint was. Um, then that is all the more reason 
to have a conversation about that and maybe to change my mind, right? To the students can absolutely change the professor's mind, can say, hey, maybe you're not aware of this, Balder, but the way you phrase this is not right. It, 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 it feels antiquated or it feels bad or it feels uncomfortable. So that would be a productive outcome of this conversation, of this situation. Instead, to freeze, basically, to no longer, to mentally no longer be able to operate in class and no longer be able to communicate and therefore not just um, not getting value out of the course, but also not contributing positively to the conversation is incredibly, incredibly destructive. Let's try to understand this generation's mind uh, a little bit better, because I personally don't have anyone in my surroundings and I've never felt uh, right the need to cancel someone um so we turn towards the internet right whenever you don't know someone <laughs> you turn towards the internet and we came across an interesting article from a student newspaper so this is the elm the student newspaper of the washington college in the united states and the article is titled cancel culture is necessary in a society with enough without enough accountability um, we are obviously going to link uh, the article in the description below. Um, we're not going to, I know it might be a bit, right? I mean, I, I don't want us to come across like we're now picking on a student who put something on a, on a newspaper and we're basically picking them apart because I have written many things at the age of uh, 18, 19, that if you were to pull them up right now, you could probably pick them apart. But we just want to read this to basically understand, right, where is this feeling coming from and also kind of what type of attitudes are we are we dealing with here? Um and so there, there's a there's a lovely quote right at the right at the beginning of this article that that reads and I quote: "Cancel culture directs accountability where accountability is due. It places a check on the seemingly uncheckable celebrities, billionaires, CEOs, or anyone with overarching power." End quote. Yeah, so the idea of um, social movements basically breaking monopolistic power structures uh, that exist within society is absolutely um, a valid approach to this, right? So the it, why do trade unions exist? Because without trade unions, basically, uh, corporate owners have way too much power and become abusive. We know this from the past. That's why you have trade unions to counterbalance it. If there is a social movement that can become a counterbalance to celebrity power or billionaire power or anything like that, then there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. That makes a lot of sense. Now, the question is, when we talk about accountability, where accountability is due, what are we actually talking about? Are we saying we're going to have a counterbalance um, to be able to reform society for the better, a movement to, to improve society and to maybe reduce a little bit the monopolistic patriarchal power structures that exist? Or is it about me and my tribe having one specific moral conviction? And if someone doesn't fall within that moral conviction, has a different moral perspective, we are going to get rid of them. We are not. It's not about holding them accountable, accountable. It is about making sure that they can no longer speak. That's a very, very different thing. So if you have a celebrity who says something that you believe is racist, it's very good to call them out on that and say, let's have a conversation about that. But to straight away say, oh, now I'm going to shine my moral righteousness on you and I'm going to get rid of you from the public sphere. That is a completely different dynamic and that has nothing to do with accountability. Right. It, it includes the assumption that I know what's right and that has to be the ultimate truth. And this is also kind of a highlight in the next quote, uh, and I quote, when someone refuses to concede to political correctness, it highlights their refusal to acknowledge the pain and offense they have caused others, end quote. Right, so again, I mean, it, first of all, it, it again kind of goes from the like, oh, I have been hurt, right? I, I, I have been hurt and someone is the aggressor here and this aggressor needs to be, uh, needs to be put uh, in the right ways. And then this is kind of continuing with the next quote, and I quote, the best way, maybe the only way, to survive cancellation is to take accountability. 
Cancel celebrities should actively acknowledge their mistakes and receive the social punishment that is adjudicated. End quote. Yeah, so if we take those together, let's that, that first one about the pain and offense that have been has been caused. This goes back to the liberal mental anxiety that is taking place, right? People are very, very quickly hurt and offended by the words of others, which is already, again, intellectually dangerous. Um, we're not talking about, you know, psychological torture or physical assault. We're talking about words here that might or might not correspond to your moral framework. Um, and then to argue that if you hurt me, the only way for you to survive cancellation is to take accountability. What are you actually saying there? Well, it means that you have to acknowledge that I am morally right. It, it, it means that you have to basically copy my words, copy my moral convictions. And if you don't do that, then I will still cancel you, which is, of course, incredibly anti-intellectual. To continue to this, and I quote, cancel culture forces us to consider our actions before we execute them, end quote. So self-censorship. Yeah, and, and once again, there is a significant difference here between, for example, breaking the law by physically or uh, psychologically assaulting someone there, and to simply have a different perspective on the world, to have different convictions, even if those convictions might be racist or sexist or something else like that. The moment that you start applying a purity test and say, if you don't pass this purity test, you better close your mouth because otherwise you will feel the consequences, is the death of a vibrant, evolving society because it leads to a society where a few establish truth and no one else is allowed to question that truth. Um, so this statement makes me feel uncomfortable to further participate in this podcast uh, because I might say something that uh, I will be cancelled for, right? I mean, it's, you, you, you see the dynamic here. Um, and, uh, and the last sentence is, I, I honestly believe, is a masterpiece and it has to be studied in a further context. Boulder, maybe you should include this in some university lecture in the future. I quote, it is time to start looking at cancel culture as a power check rather than something to fear, end quote. It is beautiful um, because if you write it, it sounds very Orwellian in that sense, could be could be taken out of 1984. And I, I had the fun earlier to kind of replace cancel culture with other words, right? So let's let, let's let's just imagine the Chinese Communist Party uh, would, would put out a statement it is time to start looking at the social credit system as a power check rather than as something to fear. We would be, we would immediately know. Oh, this is this is some this is some scary stuff. We we can, This is this is not a good idea. Or if if Putin were to say, it is time to start looking uh, at at my power as a power check rather than as something to fear. Right? You 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 can continue this game with all types of groups out there that we we perceive as dodgy. Uh, this, this sentence is a, is a pure masterpiece. I think this, this should be taken and, and sold to authoritarian systems out there. Yes, and I really encourage anyone who's listening to this and who feels that we are misrepresenting it. Well, it is not about the social movements. It is not about the political conversations. It's not about improving society. It is about saying, I am going to decide what you are allowed to do or what you aren't allowed to do if my tribe is big enough if i've got enough followers then i can check your power and as a result um, i will use my tribal power to make you behave in the way that i want to you to behave and that goes against everything that a pleasant kind generous human society should stand for surely What's the international relations context? So when we're talking about the international relations perspective, uh, there's, right, international relations can be very emotional, um, especially when we're talking about global conflicts. Um, and for example, the war in Ukraine or the conflict uh, between Israel, Palestine and Gaza right now, Thou, those can be very, very emotional because sometimes maybe they hit very close to home or it speaks to our fear of, of dying in that sense. And this is the moment when then cancel culture kind of also enters the life of international relations and enters our, our lives because 
to suddenly there is a right and a wrong side to be on in a conflict, right? There is anyone who, I don't know, anyone who criticizes weapons deliveries to Ukraine, that means they're pro-Russia. And uh, we cannot accept that that opinion, right? That, that means you're with an imperialist, something that we've criticized a lot uh, in past episodes or a bit more current with the situation in Gaza, um, where also suddenly, right, there is a right and a wrong side. Um, and it can only be one of the two sides and there can't be an additional side. And then that translates into some form of cancel culture too, which we have seen on multiple occasions in the last few months. Yeah, uh, and it once again is that triggered society where very quickly something is said that then puts you outside of the tribe and it makes the insiders in the tribe emotionally um, anxious. It makes them it makes them unable to cope with the idea that there is there is a different kind of perspective, a different kind of understanding out there, and that then leads to you being stereotyped into one very specific corner. And and again, I mean, it, it seems as if I'm I'm just quoting negative uh, feedback, but uh, so I, I actually believe it was that comment in the that I quoted previously from uh, that tried to cancel me, if you like, from university. Uh, I was called an apologist because I said something that wasn't just mean about Israel. Because I try to understand Israel, what Israel is doing. Now, I would encourage listeners, we have three episodes on uh, on the violence. I would encourage them to listen to it and then tell me if I'm an apologist of Israel. Because I don't believe I am at all. Uh, but the fact that I said one or two things that weren't, if you like, demonizing Israel, straight away turns me into an apologist for Israel. And then I am very easily put into the corner of the other, the other tribe, the tribe that needs to be defeated, the tribe that needs to be cancelled, the tribe that needs to be destroyed. So in international relations, you very quickly can identify your tribe versus the other tribe, especially when it comes to war. And you can apply cancel culture very aggressively and very violently. In some ways, you, you start a proxy war within university or within your family or within your group of friends um, because you want to side with the good guys versus the bad guys. And can you explain to our listeners what is the problem? What are the problems coming out of this, right? I mean, is this a, right, this is a, a very easy question here, but I mean, what's the problem with increased tribalism that then translates into cancer culture? Well, it leads to a increasingly antagonistic society, right? It leads to a society where we don't view each other as complex individuals. And where together we should work on positive movements, improving society, get rid of the mistakes from the past, uh, uh, strengthen the things that bind us together, um, uh, try to uh, reduce inequalities, uh, create a fairer, more just society. Those are all really good approaches, but it becomes almost impossible if you believe that you are one individual fighting the rest and you have identified with one tribe of other individuals fighting the outsider fighting the other you create a society where you're constantly at war you hear something that you believe is morally um, incorrect morally wrong that is the moment that you start the aggression you start the violence rather than saying where does this come from Let's understand each other. Maybe we can have a positive conversation about this. Uh, maybe we can put some pressure on that person, if it's a powerful person, to change their ways. No, no, immediately, bang, get rid of him, get rid of her. Mm. I mean, red lines are being lowered, right? It's because it's, I mean, who, because my question is always, who decides what's right and wrong? Um, in this case, it's the person who elevates themselves to this nature, godlike status of, I decide what's right and wrong. I'm the individual. I'm the most important person in Western society. Um, and I decide what the red lines are. And let's be honest, the red lines have been lowered because depending on the individual, right, there's always someone who feels offended by this and feels offended by that. Um, and it creates an uneasy environment at universities, which, at least in Western societies, are the ultimate space of free speech and free thought. 
right? And this, this can be incredibly hurtful. And in the example I, I, I used, right, we, we had a conversation about this a, a few days ago, um, right? I mean, there, there has to be a difference somewhere between, let's say, a professor saying something terrible that I disagree with, okay, then I will talk, I don't know, I will confront them in class, I will talk to them afterwards, I'll write them an email. And there has to be a difference between, let's say, a professor sexually harassing a student, right? And then I would be the first one to to write very angry letters to, to the university saying that, hello, it, this can't happen, right? This is breaking a law. This is breaking, hopefully, a code of conduct. Um, and this cannot be this cannot be happening. So uh, there should be the consequence that the system has designed, which should be that this person loses their job and can no longer uh, be a professor because they have disqualified them for doing so, but not by saying something that goes against someone else's opinion. Yes, and this is exactly it. So we have laws in place. Now, those laws aren't perfect, but if you sexually assault someone or assault someone in general, physically assault someone, or even if you have a campaign of psychological torture against someone there are laws in place if there if those laws aren't in place then very often there are very clear rules within a university structure within organizations against that so the moment you break those rules or you break the law then there of course is a reaction and if the system isn't um good enough in that sense if the the laws and the rules aren't in place yet you can have conversations about those rules in general we should have clearer rules when it comes to i don't know harassment or against discrimination all of that is part of an evolving conversation within society or within universities to improve our ways that is very different from targeting an individual who hasn't broken the rules who hasn't broken the law but who just makes you feel uncomfortable who makes you say or who says things that make you disagree with that person that make you upset somehow that should never be a reason for punishing that individual because then you get into these very dangerous dynamics so those red lines that you mentioned that have been lowered is in the past we would all agree that if someone broke the law if or if someone broke the rules of the university there would be consequences and all you would need to do is point out those consequences to the legal authorities or to the university authorities but now we've gone way further than that and we are actually claiming that we can be the arbiters of who deserves to be punished and who shouldn't be punished at an individual level me as an individual judging another individual and that is very, very scary. So what do we do if the system doesn't work? So, so we point this out, right? We, we observe, um, let's say, sexual harassment. Um, and we point this out to the university leadership. Um, and because of a certain rot in institutions, right, that we've talked about before, right? I mean, the, the, let's say there's, the president is good friends with the professor who sexually assaulted someone. Um, and what if there's no accountability? So what the what the student right in the student newspaper uh, case study that we read out earlier said right? What if there's no accountability? How do we how do we deal with this? That is ex that's extremely difficult in those situations because we do know that there are institutional powers that be. We do know that institutions and even legal authorities don't work perfectly because of internal corruption, the rot that you mentioned. Um, what you can always and should always do is then put pressure on the institution to change their structures, to change their approach, to basically point out that there might be uh, internal corruption, that the rules aren't fairly applied or that the rules are not well designed, that the rules are not well formulated. All of those things are valid and important conversations and dynamics to have. But what you cannot do is say, oh, I feel that the university hasn't taken sufficient action or that the government hasn't taken sufficient action. So I will take matters into my own hands and I will now go after that individual. First of all, because you're not the authority, you do not have all the information available. You cannot trust yourself to be exactly right. And even if you're 100% convinced, for example, you're the victim, then still you can't take a gun and shoot your assailant. Well, you can, but that would be detrimental to society. Uh, even though people might understand you, uh, that is not the way we organize society properly. Uh, that is not the way that we get into a, into a better tomorrow where we evolve in constructive ways. So essentially, 
work on strengthening institutions, work on strengthening patterns, on structures, on rules and regulations, but do not go after individuals. Certainly not if you do so at, as an individual yourself. And what now? So what do we do now? I mean, we have, we live in a world where this is becoming more and more prominent, where it's now, right? I mean, we, we, we've talked about this before, that usually any form of social trends emerge in the United States uh, a few years before they emerge in Europe. So now this is also happening in Europe. I've experienced this at, at my previous universities. You've experienced this now. How do we get rid of this or... In other words, what's our New Year's message for 2024? Well, my, my wish, which is not my message, but my wish would be that people um, go back to understanding that intellectual differences do not have to make you anxious, that someone saying things that you feel uncomfortable with intellectually or somehow in terms of morally doesn't mean that you straight away have to turn into panic mode and have to lash out against that person. That, that's a wish. And sort of the message would be, let's be kind towards each other. Let's be generous towards each other. Let's understand that we are all fragile human beings and we all sometimes say certain things that we don't mean. And sometimes we say things that we do mean because we have a different philosophical background or you know you take take any um, um, man certainly growing up in the 17th century and they will have been horribly racist and horribly sexist way more than your average man in 2024 does that mean that they were despicable human beings no it just means that they were if you like a victim of their own surroundings and they were part of a mechanism that needs to be changed so be generous to, to, to the other, be kind to the other. And, and if you believe that they are wrong, have that conversation with them or have that conversation in general if they intimidate you. Don't, don't talk to them, but talk to your society and say, hey, is this the kind of approach that we want rather than trying to hurt the other, per the other person? This seems like a great moment to end today's conversation on cancel culture. If you have any questions, comments, or regards, make sure to send us an email to thewesternbubble at gmail.com and we will try to incorporate them in our following episodes. Thank you very much to the listeners for joining us today. Make sure to join us again next week when we burst the Western bubble. That is it from my side, Balder. Which closing quote did you pick for us today? Well, it is a quote that isn't particularly original. In fact, if I recall correctly, I once quoted it before in the early days of this podcast, but it, it is absolutely the fundamental quote in, uh, on the topic like today, which is by Voltaire, who said, I may not agree with what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it.